must, 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 kalandar, must. Welcome to the Chapter 11 Overview, The Worlds of Islam, 600 to 1500. Main idea, the newest of the world's major religions, Islam had a major cultural, political, and economic influence from 600 to 1500 that stretched from Asia to Europe. Relevance. Islam is the second largest religion in the world and stretches across the globe. On the map, the red countries are the ones with the highest population of Muslims, and the lighter the color, the lower the population is. But you can see it's definitely a global religion. Divisions within Islam, such as Sunni and Shia, as well as divisions between Islamic states and neighbors, dominate the news today. It's very important to have a background in this influential religion to understand the world around us. Setting the stage. Islam began in the Arabian Peninsula, in what is now Saudi Arabia, shown here on the map. There, nomadic Arabs lived on the borders between two established civilizations. The Byzantine Empire, which you might remember from chapter 10, which continued Roman traditions, and the Sassanid Empire, which continued Persian traditions. Arabs were exposed through trade connections to the two dominant religions of the region, Christianity and Judaism. The message of Islam is closely related to these two monotheistic faiths. Together, the three of them are the major religions of the Western world. This is a good place for us to look at the predominant ethnic groups in this part of the world. The Turks, or Turkic people, live throughout Central Asia. The Arabs began as a nomadic group on the Arabian Peninsula, which is here. And the Persians were in modern-day Iran, shown in blue on this map. Islam began in the Arab culture and was adopted in various forms and locations by the Persians and Turks. Look for each of these ethnic groups in this chapter and remember that they each carried to Islam their own language, ethnic identity, and cultural customs. You'll read more about them in the relevant areas of the chapter. So the first heading is called The Birth of a New Religion. Islam was born on the Arab Peninsula, and while it had commonalities with the Judaic and Christian traditions, it quickly distinguished itself from the two and spread throughout the Arab world. The Homeland of Islam. This section reviews Arab culture before the birth of Islam. Largely pastoral, the Arab culture was politically divided into small warring tribes and clans. Culturally, it was polytheistic. The Kaaba was a shrine to 360 gods. By the 6th century, the culture was becoming increasingly monotheistic, identifying with Christianity and Judaism. This section ends by reviewing the economic connections Arabia enjoyed with other cultures, especially throughout the Indian Ocean trade network to the south. So here's the Arab Peninsula here. And the Arabian Sea connects to the Indian Ocean down on this map to the southeast. And it's going to be a very important trade connection for the development of Islam. The Messenger and the Message Muhammad was a trader and merchant, remember that, it's important, who lived in Mecca. Islamic tradition states that beginning in 610 and continuing for 22 years, he received divine revelation from God, who was called Allah in Arabic. These revelations are collected as the Quran and form the primary holy text of Islam. This section goes on to explain the basic teachings of Islam. Muhammad called upon his followers to reject the idols of the Kaaba and accept Allah as the one true God. Muslim in Arabic means one who submits. This was the first of five central beliefs of the religion that together are known as the five pillars of Islam, which are accepting that Allah is the one true God, praying five times a day facing Mecca, giving to the poor, fasting during the month of Ramadan, and completing the Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca. With these beliefs, Muhammad set out to create a new Arabian society focused on the Ummah, a community bound by the central belief in Islam. The Transformation of Arabia Once Muhammad began to spread his message, he encountered fierce opposition from rivals, and Muhammad and his followers left Mecca and traveled to a city that welcomed him, which came to be called Medina. So if you look on the map here, we're in the Arabian Peninsula. And here's Mecca, where Muhammad received the revelations from God, and his followers moved to the north here to a city called Medina. In Medina, Muhammad established a community of believers known as an Ummah. This focus on community became very important in the Islamic world. Muhammad then clashed militarily with his enemies in Mecca, and his power and influence soon spread with a series of victories, creating a state with Muhammad as both its religious and political head. And on this map, which shows the expansion of Islam, the original state under Muhammad is shown here in dark purple. This happened during his lifetime. The book contrasts the early years of Islam with those of Christianity, so look out for key differences, both political and religious. As you can see on the map, by the time of Muhammad's death in 632, a sizable state controlled much of the Arabian Peninsula. In the coming decades, again shown on this map, Islamic influence would spread throughout the region. The making of an Arab empire. In the centuries after the death of Muhammad, Islam had profound cultural, political, and economic effects in Afro-Eurasia. War and conquest. 
This section describes the sweeping and sometimes surprising victories that made the Islamic Empire possible, first against the Sassanid and Byzantine empires, then across North Africa, into Western Europe, and to the east into India and Central Asia. So the map um, shows the original state under Muhammad, as we talked about, and then it's going to spread across North Africa and into Europe. It's also going to spread throughout the Middle East and into Central Asia, and eventually towards India into South Asia over here. This section ends with an explanation of how this was accomplished and the attitudes of Muslim leaders towards conquered subjects. A key feature was a tax called the jizya that could be paid by non-Muslim subjects, demonstrating a degree of religious tolerance. In many cases, though, widespread conversion to Islam accompanied the spreading political reach of the empire. Conversion to Islam The spread of Islamic culture meant that millions converted to Islam for various reasons, including the following. The success of the Islamic conquest caused polytheistic believers to question their gods, while the monotheistic nature of Islam was more appealing to Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. From a practical standpoint, the jizya could be avoided if you converted to Islam, and merchants found Islam to be friendly to commerce, partly because Muhammad himself is a merchant. There were areas of strong resistance, and others were residents converted to Islam but kept their culture, but in general the spread of Islam resulted in massive cultural change. Divisions and Controversies After Muhammad's death, the Islamic world was beset with the problem of who would succeed him. The position held by Muhammad, head of state of an Islamic empire, is called a caliph. Controversy over the rule of the first four caliphs after Muhammad, known as the rightly guided caliphs, initiated a conflict within the Muslim world that persists to this day. Sunni Muslims, who are the majority today, supported political rule by Abu Bakr and invested a group of religious scholars known as the ulama with religious authority. Shia Muslims wanted caliphs to be from the ancestral line of Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law, and rejected the political authority of the caliphs, investing leaders called imams with religious and political authority. Two major caliphates emerged, first the Umayyad and then the Abbasid. The Umayyad Caliphate, 661 to 750, was dominated by Arabs with a capital in Damascus and present-day Syria. The Abbasid Caliphate, 750 to 1258, was dominated by Persians, moving the capital to Baghdad in present-day Iraq. Within these political systems, various interpretations of Muslim theology developed. The first, called Sharia law, presented specific directions for how to live life properly as a Muslim, and this was developed by the scholarship of the ulama. The second, known as Sufism, was more mystical, focusing on a direct experience with God. You can loosely compare that to Taoism in China. Reconciling these two interpretations occupied the intentions of many scholars, such as Al-Ghazali. Women and men in early Islam. Gender roles in early Islam were based on a combination of proscriptions in the Quran, interpretations of the actions of Muhammad's life, which are called hadiths, and the Arab cultural traditions. The Quran clearly states that men and women are spiritually equal, but makes distinctions in social roles. This section reviews examples of equality and authority for women, and examples of patriarchy. While women were given control over property and the right of divorce, in reality these systems favored men. As the early caliphates expanded, restrictions on the rights of women expanded as well, such as requiring separate worship and veiling in public. There were some spaces within the spiritual world of Islam that gave women an opportunity for equality, such as Sufism. In general, though, gender roles in early Islamic states mirrored the roles of pre-Islamic Arab culture, as well as systems of patriarchy outside the Arab world, such as in China. Islam and Cultural Encounter Arab culture continued to spread after the fall of the Abbasid Caliphate in the 13th century, with similar and different effects on India, Anatolia, West Africa, and Spain. The Case of India this heading looks at the nature of the Islamic world in four different locations. It's a good opportunity to practice comparison skills, so definitely look for similarities and differences as you read. Let's look at India first. Islam came to South Asia through conquest beginning around 1000 by Turkic warriors who had recently converted to Islam. The state shown in orange here on the map is a sultanate centered in Delhi that was established by these Turkic conquerors. These conquests initiated centuries of conflict in India between Muslims and Hindus, with Muslim numbers being concentrated in the north, the direction of invasion. A series of Muslim ruling states called sultanates dominated northern India during this era. In India, acceptance of Islam is minimal, with a maximum of 25% converting, and the majority retaining the religious traditions of Hinduism. This may seem surprising, given the tendency of Hinduism to absorb other traditions, but the sharp theological contrast between polytheistic Hindu beliefs and Islam's extreme monotheism helps to explain the division between the two faiths, which persists in the region to this day. The case of Anatolia. 
Turkic invaders also conquered Anatolia, and unlike India, about 90% of the population converted to Islam. There are several reasons for this difference, but a main one is the combination of religious and political authority in the Byzantine Empire. Remember, the Byzantine Empire was conquered by Muslims. So if you look on the map here in red, this is the essential early Byzantine Empire of this era. And when Islam spread to Anatolia, which is now Turkey, it involved conquering Byzantium. If you remember Caesar of Papism, it created a centralized state. And when Byzantium was conquered by the Turks, a political and religious vacuum was created, leading to greater acceptance of the new faith in the region. By contrast, in India, Hinduism and the caste system facilitated decentralized government, and so no religious vacuum accompanied the political change of conquest. As you take notes, look for other reasons Islam was accepted in Anatolia, and the effects on the region. By the 14th century, the Turks built a new Islamic state, known as the Ottoman Empire, shown on the map here. You will learn more about this state later. The case of West Africa. In contrast to India and Anatolia, Islam spread to West Africa by trade routes rather than conquest, specifically by Arab merchants participating in the Trans-Saharan trade network. So on the map, we have the trade routes shown here in yellow. And we also have, by 1500, shown in red here, the extent of Islamic influence and expansion in Africa. By 1500, then, the northern half of Africa was Islamic, largely ruled by Arabs. Islam had political and cultural effects on the major kingdoms of West Africa, such as Mali, shown here with the diagonal lines, Ghana, shown right here in green, and Songhe, shown here in brown, and you'll read more about those in a future chapter. Islam brought political legitimacy, stimulated economic connections, and cities in the region served as centers of Islamic scholarship. In contrast to other Islamic empires, in West Africa, religious syncretism was common, in which Islam was merged with traditional beliefs to create new customs. Finally, the case of Spain. The first wave of Islamic expansion in the 7th century brought Islam all the way to Western Europe by way of North Africa, and Muslims ruled Spain until the 5th century. So if you see here, it's going to spread across North Africa, and by the 8th century, the Muslims have ruled Spain, which at the time was called Andalusia. Rule of Spain provided the main path for Islamic, Greek, and Roman scholarship to make its way to Christian Europe, which would become important in the Renaissance in a few centuries. Muslim rule in Spain had other effects as well. The early centuries of Muslim rule were marked by religious tolerance for Jews and Christians, but by the 10th century this had changed and there was much less tolerance. Be sure to take notes on these effects. By 1200, Christians began the process of reconquering Spain, and in 1492 Muslim rule ended in Europe. At the same time, that Ottoman rule was displacing Byzantium in the east. So there's sort of a seesaw effect with Muslims being pushed out of Europe from the west, but beginning to dominate the eastern part of the region with its conquest of the Byzantine Empire. The last heading is called the World of Islam. Despite the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate, by 1500 the Islamic world provided some unity to much of Afro-Eurasia. Networks of faith. As we have seen, Islam spread across Afro-Eurasia, and politically there was little unification, especially after the fall of the Abbasid Caliphate. There was a degree of cultural unification under the umbrella of Islam, and this was provided by the ulama, the community of scholars who served as interpreters of the faith. The efforts of this scholarly community helped to apply Islam to a variety of cultures. Religious schools, called madrasas, provided a common educational network, and over the centuries the faith developed an extensive body of scholarship. This process is common to all the major religions. The tradition of Sufi mysticism, this is a picture of a Sufi poet named Rumi, with its focus on the individual experience also helped Islam to adapt to a variety of cultures. After the fall of the Abbasid Caliphate, the Islamic world split politically, but it's common for us to speak of an Islamic world or even empire during this whole era to describe the remarkable connection across diverse cultures. Networks of exchange. Religions rely on trade connections to spread across the globe and this is especially true with Islam and its positive view of commerce. All the major trade networks dis discussed in Chapter 8 saw extensive participation by Islamic traders. So this map is focusing on Muslim trade routes, but if you look at them, you can see that they include the Silk Roads. The book mentions that Muslim traders established trading outposts within China. It also includes the Indian Ocean Trade Network, in which Muslims participated especially extensively. It included trade networks through the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East. 
Here are the Trans-Saharan trade networks. And of course, the Mediterranean sea lanes as well. And this, these Islamic states will develop trade connections into the parts of Western Europe that they control. In addition to participating in trade networks, a variety of important goods were exchanged, including some major agricultural products, such as bananas, sugarcane, and rice. And technology also was spread throughout Afro-Eurasia by these connections. Be sure to include specific examples in your notes of each of these. In the realm of scholarship and technology, Islam built upon classical Greek scholarship and made several key advancements. Look at the snapshot on page 499 for specific examples. Now the 10 second spice review. Islam began in the 7th century creating new states throughout Afro-Eurasia. Muslim merchants were increasingly involved in trade networks, which facilitated the introduction of new foods. The new ideas of Islam reinforced patriarchal traditions in Afro-Eurasia. A visual summary. We're starting, of course, with Muhammad and the birth of the religion. If you think of organizing this chapter by region, we have Islam in the Middle East and Central Asia, and that would be the original caliphates and then the rule in Anatolia. We have Islam spreading to South Asia, and that would be India and the Sultanates. We have it spreading to Africa, and that would be across North Africa soon after the religion is born, and then across the Trans-Saharan trade networks to West Africa. And then we have it spreading to Europe, to Spain. And for each of these regions, you can think of studying and analyzing the causes and effects of the expansion, both politically, culturally, and economically, although uh, social themes and interaction between humans and the environment will come into play as well. That's your Chapter 11 overview. Happy reading! Must, 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 must